you ever notice how songs you learn as children stick in your mind and kind of come back to you? I bet right now you could all probably sing Jesus Loves Me by heart. Why don't we do that? Of course, our children are learning hymns that are a little more upbeat. In fact, if you grow up in First Baptist Church, you don't grow up without learning a song called Pharaoh, Pharaoh. And I've got three that are going to help me this morning. Would you guys come up here and, and teach us Pharaoh, Pharaoh? Now, you guys got to learn the motions, too. I know all of our VBS snack ladies know the motions. Thank you guys. We're going to let them go on down to Children's Church now. But as we were thinking about songs that we learned when we were growing up, when my parents were little, they actually had their own hymnal. It was called the Junior Hymnal. Did anybody ever sing out of the Broadman Junior Hymnal? Oh, I actually have a couple that remember the Broadman Junior Hymnal. Uh, there was a song in the old Broadman Hymnal that my mom used to sing to me. I, I'm not quite old enough to have sang it when I was a kid except for she taught it to me when I was little and our scripture this morning reminded me of that hymn that just kind of sticks in your head it's called be you doers of the word and it's just out of the King James version of James 122 in fact it starts like this out of James 122 comes a call for juniors true and then there's a verse in there that I always liked I didn't know why I liked it until I became a Star Wars fan later on Y'all tell me if this sounds like Yoda. Kind to others we would be, Jesus' likeness they would see. <laughs> Way before we knew what Star Wars was, we sang these songs that sounded like it. But the refrain is really easy. It's just this James 1, 22. It's, be ye doers of the word, be ye doers of the word, be ye doers of the word, not hearers, not hearers only, be ye doers of the word. Now, I've got to warn you. I'm going to get Eddie to play this for us. Once you hear this B.B. McKinney tune, it's going to stick in your head. Because it's been in mind for a long, long time. Eddie, go ahead and play it through us once, and then maybe James will teach us to it. Now, is there anybody else here other than me that had actually heard that song before? A few of you know that one. It's an easy tune that just kind of sticks in your mind. And it's in that old Broadman hymnal because B.B. McKinney wrote that little tune to bring that verse alive to us. 
And B.B. McKinney, if he wrote a song back when the Broadman hymnal was being published, it got in there. B.B. <laughs> McKinney, he was the guy. Uh, those tunes are those things that just kind of stick in our head. There are a lot of others. And by the way, if you actually know what B.B. stands for, let me know later on. It always just says B.B. McKinney. I think I know, but maybe you know that. Now, B.B. McKinney could get songs into our hymnal, but James, James the brother of Jesus, actually had a hard time getting into our scripture. Did you know that? That when the Bible was put together by the different councils, they debated over James. They weren't sure if they wanted this book in the Bible, and why would James get this bad rap? Because James talks very, very much about doing the work of God. James talks a lot about works. And we know that we are saved by grace. And so there was a theological debate about whether James should be in there. But you can't leave the brother Jesus out of Scripture. <laughs> and I am glad that James made it into what we call our canon or our Scriptures together. Because I think we need a reminder that we are to be doers of the word. That our faith is an act of faith. It's not just something we talk about. It's not just something we experience. It is something that we live out. James says, if you want to show me your faith by what you say, I will show you my faith by what I do. Where did James get that? Well, of course, he got it from Jesus, his brother. If you go back into the book of Matthew and you look there in the Sermon on the Mount, in the seventh chapter, as Jesus wraps everything up, he says this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house. Now that's another kid's song, isn't it? We're not going to sing that one, guys. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house in the sand and the rains came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and there was a great crash. Jesus says, if you want to really be my followers, you can't just say that you are. You have to act like Jesus. You have to live out the word of God. Well, where did Jesus get this? Well, this is very congruent with what Jesus grew up with in the Jewish tradition, in the Jewish scriptures. There is what is called the Shema. The Shema is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. It's called the Shema because that Hebrew word Shema means to hear. But when we talk about this word hear in Hebrew, it is much more than just words going into your ears. Did your mom ever say to you, my words are just going in one ear and out the other? <laughs> That's how we often treat God as well. It's not about perceiving sound. When the Bible talks about hearing, it is about listening and doing. When Moses gathered the people together in Exodus 24, they recite the covenant and they remember the law. The people respond in Exodus 24, 3, everything the Lord has said, we will do. Are you understanding how this concept of doing the word is all throughout scripture? When God is speaking to us, it's not that just we stop and listen. That's important. But it's also about doing. Our faith starts with hearing. As Paul writes in Romans. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How about you? Do you hear God's voice? And when you do, do you obey what God is saying? I was at the beach this past week, and Valerie, I enjoyed worshiping with you guys online. That's a wonderful experience. And, and as we were down there, though, we would see these families down on the beach. And every once in a while, a mother would try to gather up the kids. I, I felt sorry for some of those moms. 
Do you know how hard it is to get kids to come in off the beach? <laughs> They're out there playing and splashing the water. They don't want to come in. And one of them will say something like this. Do you hear me? And she might get a little bit upset. But you can't blame those kids. They're being distracted. And we too are distracted by life. Think about how much distracts us. I mean, the television's there 24-7. And if that's not enough, we've got the internet. And if the internet's not enough, it comes to us on our phones now. And now my phone's not even good enough. Now I've got a watch that when my phone gives me a text, my watch beeps at me and buzzes at me. It's like, get my attention. Everything is calling to us. Our families need us. Our work needs us. Our friends need us. And in the midst of all of that, God is speaking. We are so distracted by life. As long as I've told you how old I am by some of these old songs we sang this morning, I will also tell you that when I was growing up, we actually had to tune the radio. <laughs> you didn't have these buttons, things that just automatically go to stations. You had a little dial and you turned it, and if you turned it too far, it got staticky, and you turned it back the other way and you went past the channel, it got staticky that way, and it was a skill to tune in the radio. I remember my dad out in the car in the evening trying to listen to the Atlanta Braves game. And he'd get the radio on in the car and he'd turn it with one way and then the other until he could finally hear that broadcast. Out of all the static that is in our lives, it takes work to tune in to the Word of God, to hear the Word of God. And how do we hear it? James talks about listening to the perfect law. When James talks about the perfect law, what is he talking about? Well, maybe he's talking about the Ten Commandments. You shall have no gods before me. You shall not make unto yourself any graven image. You shall not take the name of your Lord God in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. You shall honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. That's a good start. Those boundaries in life that we need to know that we put God first. And when we put God first, there are certain things that we just don't do. And as God says, they are sinful. They will lead us to destruction. But we also know that the perfect law is actually Jesus who came to show us how to live out God's law. How the words of scripture have come to life in Christ. And how when he taught us, he said, you could obey the law if you would just do two things. One is to love God with everything you have. And the other is to love your neighbor as yourself. James talks about the law giving us liberty are giving us life and freedom. You say, well, laws seem constricting, but that's not what it's like. When we hear what it is that we are not to do and hear what it is that we are to do, and we obey Jesus, we actually are free to live the life that God has called us to live. The life that God intended for us. And our faith is lived out in following by our actions, by doing but we're sinful people. We are often selfish people. We usually do the things that benefit us. Maybe you heard the story. It was first told, I think, by Scott Sanders, who was a professor at Indiana University. It was about a prominent builder in a small Ohio town. <clears throat> when he was building his house there, the volunteer fire chief came and said, we're glad you're moving here. Would you like to sign up for the volunteer fire department? <laughs> he kind of laughed and said, nope, it's all right, don't need you guys. I'm a builder. I'm building this house out of brick. I'm building the electrical to code. I have smoke detectors. Everything's great about my house until it wasn't. <laughs> One night those smoke detectors went off and the house was on fire and he ran out and the volunteer fire department came running in and before they hooked up the hoses, the chief went over to the guy and said, you want to sign up now? <laughs> you see, we tend to do stuff 
when it's something we want or something that we need. But James is talking about not doing things just for our own sake, but for the sake of the kingdom of God. That we live out the word for others. So that the world might hear of God and God's love and grace and forgiveness. The world will never hear us until we live lives out of love and grace. Mahatma Gandhi is often quoted as saying this, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. You Christians are so unlike your Christ. That's been said from a lot of pulpits. But that quote actually you can't find. It's not written down anywhere. Maybe he said it, maybe he didn't. The closest thing to it is in a book by E. Stanley Jones called uh, The Christ of the Indian Road, uh, Road. In it, Jones asked Gandhi, how could he bring Christianity to India? And Gandhi said this, actually. He said, I would suggest, first of all, that all of you Christians, especially you missionaries, begin to live more like your Jesus. Very similar, but a little bit different. He didn't say, I don't like you, but I like your Christ. What he said is, if you want to convince me what Christ is like, live like Jesus. Live like Jesus. The fastest growing religious group is the non-religious. They're called the nuns. You know, N-E-S. They have no religious affiliation. People are, are leaving church in droves. And do you know what they say when they're interviewed? They say there's too much condemnation in the church. The church is too much like the world. We don't see any difference. There's fighting, uh, there's bickering, there's politics. In our growing young efforts here at church, one of the things that churches that are actually reaching younger people do is they put Jesus first and foremost. They lead with Jesus. They lead with God's grace. James says that we are to help those who have been defiled by the world. What does that mean? Does that mean just to point out their sin? Yes, the church should teach right and wrong. But it means that we are to help those who are called up in sin see a better way of life, to show a different way of living. Ralph Waldo Emerson said it this way, your actions speak so loudly, I cannot hear what you are saying. We as First Baptist Church are called to live out God's love. This verse is simple. This sermon is simple. Hear the word, do the word. But what will you do with that? Lou Holtz said it this way. He said, when all is said and done, more is usually said than done. I think he nailed it. This coming Saturday, we will have something called Operation Inasmuch. We advertise it as a time when our entire church comes together for one day and does ministry, does missions together. But will we show up for that? Or even more important, will we do that same thing each and every week of our lives? Years ago when I was first in ministry, I read an article about a group of folks in Colorado. They were passing around a petition to take tax-exempt status away from churches. But they weren't just going to take it away from the churches. They were going to allow churches that could prove that they actually served their communities to be tax exempt. <laughs> but the church would have to prove it. And that kind of scared me. I didn't want that to pass in any state for a lot of different reasons. But the proof that they were looking for was this. They said if a church served orphans or the elderly or the homeless. And I thought, how could these folks that are against church know exactly what the scripture says 
James says that true religion is to love others, especially those who are most in need, the orphans and the widows and those in distress. James says you want to show someone your faith? Show them your love. Hear the word and do the word.